My name is Abby McAllister. I'm based in Juneau. I am a wildlife and education, wildlife education and outreach specialist uh, for the Alaska Department of Fish and Game in the Division of Wildlife Conservation. Uh, I serve Region 1, so I serve all of Southeast Alaska. Uh, what is it that I do? Well, basically, it's my job to help uh, share information from my department uh, with the public. It's everything from skills-based classes to things like this, wildlife safety for the public. And I also will do publications and brochures, hunter education, uh, a little bit of everything. Um, I've been doing this job uh, since 2015. And before that, I was a journalist uh, for the Juno Empire uh, for about 11 years, where I um, wrote and edited the outdoor section of the Juno Empire. So I did a did a lot of writing and learning about wildlife before I came to this job. And I'll go ahead and hand it off to Marion. We're gonna take turns presenting tonight, so take it away. Okay, yeah, my name is Marion Stively and I am the Wildlife Education Specialist Outreach out of Regions 2, that includes Anchorage, Homer, Kenai, Cordova. Um, <clears throat> and my jobs, I, I'm the newest member of the Wildlife Education Specialist uh, Program, so I'm still figuring out my job. I've been here for about six months, um, but very similar to Abby, we work together quite a bit. I'm very excited to be presenting with Abby. This is our first time doing this together. Mm -hmm. Previous to this position, I was a wildlife biologist for about 20 years, 15 years with the state of Alaska. Um, when I got my new job, I'm only one office down across the hall from my, where my old office was. So it's really nice to still be with this great group of people. I really like it here. Okay. And I will begin. <laughs> Hang on one second, that just got really big. <clears throat> so our goals are to mainly kind of give you tips on how to behave in bear, moose, wolf um, country. Um, what to do in, let's say, a bear encounter, a moose encounter, or if you see a wolf. Um, we would like people to be comfortable um, traveling in bear country, and part of that is just figuring out what to do, um, how to stay safe. We want to increase your overall wildlife safety. Um, we want to help people to reduce risks in, in wildlife um, in Alaska with these wildlife species. But we also want to emphasize critical thinking and personal responsibility. So <clears throat> coastal Alaska is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the habitat here, as you can see, in southeast Alaska, you don't see as much urban area compared to, let's say, Anchorage, for instance. But both these have something in common, um, and that's really good habitat for wildlife. Even in the largest city in Alaska, you can see the mountains with lots of riparian zones, and lots of greenery for, um, for moose, bears, and wolves. Okay, and our neighborhoods, this is actually a picture out of uh, Juneau, but it's similar in, in Anchorage too. They look a lot like this, so you have Salmon streams, you have neighborhoods and our homes butted up against these green, green belts where wildlife can thrive. And so <clears throat> we're going to talk a little bit about bears. We have three species of bears in Alaska, which most people know, the polar bear, the black bear, and the brown bear, which is the same species as a grizzly bear. But we're only going to focus on the black and the brown um, bears for this presentation. So Let's say you are walking along and from a distance you see a bear and you kind of want to know what type of bear are you looking at? And so, well, <clears throat> a brown bear, you think, of course, you know, brown bear is brown and black bear is black, but that's not always the case. Brown bears can be very light colored and they can be fairly dark and black bears can be very light. They can be cinnamon colored. They can be black. They can even be a, this bluish color called a glacier bear. And I've seen some pictures out of Canada of some black bears actually being white. I think they call them a ghost bear. And I have um, a couple of pelts I wanted to show. So this is your typical grizzly or brown bear pelt. It's a small one. Um, and it's got kind of a little grizzled area. You can kind of see the tips. And then, <clears throat> excuse me. And this is a typical black bear pelt. 
Let me just see. Um, it's very dark in color, so this would pr be fairly easy to discern. Um, but there are other ways to tell the difference between the two, two bears. Go ahead. So one of the most prominent is this great big hump on the back of, a, of the, the brown or grizzly bears. And that is, so the purpose of that is it's really muscular and they, they dig a lot. They dig for small mammals or they'll dig up rotting logs uh, for grubs. And they can move a lot of dirt around. It's pretty amazing. And so you look for the hump. If you look to the left, the black bear doesn't really have that. Okay, Abby. Um, hopefully you're not close enough to see their claws, but a brown bear will have longer, um, longer claws. And let's see if you can see this. They're quite, quite a bit long compared to, this is just a, a plastic cast. So this is a black bear. And so these are more like curved, they're shorter, they're closer to the paw than these. And so the longer paws help the grizzly bears and brown bears to move more dirt. Whereas the curved claws on the black bear allows them to climb trees a little more easily. They've evolved more in a forested area. Brown bears though can climb trees, but not as easily as the black bears. The other one is their snouts. And, um, oh, let's see, we'll talk about that in a second. So this is, uh, this is a black bear skull. And if you put this here, it's, it's pretty almost flush. There's not a lot of space between this marker and the snout of the bear, whereas this is one of a grizzly bear, a brown bear. And if you put that same thing up here, you can see a pretty big uh, gap. So it's that kind of a concave or a, a dish face to its, it, to its face. <clears throat> so you might also think of, sorry, Abby, you forget about size. So um, on average, brown bears are much bigger than black bears. Um, a male brown bear can be 400 to 1,000 pounds, but a male black bear can also be fairly big. They can be from 150 to 400 pounds, so there can be a little bit of overlap there in size, so that's not the best way to tell. Okay, Abby. Okay, hang on. I admitted someone from the waiting room. Go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> and so about um, bear foods, what do they eat? We have a lot of food in coastal areas for bears, just in the city alone. Um, in the spring, brown bears eat a lot of grasses and sedges. They're very high in protein. It's a very important food for bears because the fish aren't running yet and the berries aren't ripe yet. And so they need to gorge on these sedges and grasses. They eat lots of berries. They'll eat um, Devil's club berries, they'll eat blueberries, and of course they'll eat fish. That's a very important food for them. When they start running, um, they'll eat moose, um, especially moose carcasses, um, and that can all be found in the cities. <clears throat> okay, here's a good example of bear doing what a bear should do. Um, this black bear has a huge uh, salmon that it caught, and um, so they have a lot of natural foods too. Okay. so. <clears throat> we want to talk a little bit about staying safe in bear country. And so the backstory of this slide is that these three people, they were hiking and um, they saw the bear and they started running from the bear. Of course, that bear is now thinking, I'm a predator in their, their prey, so he started chasing them. Um, luckily, a ranger across the river told them to stop, told them to make yourself big, put your arms up. They didn't have any bear spray, so they couldn't ready their deterrent, which we'll talk about a little later. Um, group up, make yourself big, and talk to the bear, be firm. And so in this slide, they did end up actually turning to the bear and went side by side, which gives you more surface area. You look like a bigger animal that way. They actually approached the bear. Um, <clears throat> later on, this bear actually went after three other people um, who instantly played dead, which you don't want to just instantly play dead. You don't want to play dead. And so the bear actually bit one of the people. The other two got up and yelled at the bear and it went off. But eventually this bear had to be, he had to be killed. Okay. Stay aware and be prepared. That's the most important thing when you're going out traveling. 
Um, you want to be prepared and you just want to use all your senses. Go ahead, Abby. You want to make a lot of noise. You want to just yell out. You say, hey, bear, clap your hands. Clapping your hands is really effective. Um, say, hey, bear, whole bear, whatever you want to say, but just alert bears to your presence. You want to carry bear spray or bear deterrent. You want to have it handy and you want to know how to use it. You can buy inert uh, bear spray at some of the local um, sporting goods uh, stores and you can practice using this. <clears throat> also with the bear spray, you don't want to carry it in your backpack. A lot of people I know carry bear spray in their backpack and you don't have time to dig that out. You want it close to you. You want it, you know, sometimes they, they have chest carriers. You can carry it on your chest or your side or your belt. Um, do you want to be able to grab that really quickly if you need to? You can also get one that stays on your belt and you can, it's kind of flexible and you can take it and shoot from the hip if you have time. <clears throat> um, you want to move cautiously, especially along creeks and on blind corners. Um, in heavily vegetated areas, if it's along a creek, there's going to be background noise. The bear might not hear you. You might not hear the bear. So you just want to make a lot of noise and, and move slowly and cautiously. <clears throat> it's important that you travel in a group. The more people you are together with, um, the less chance that you're, you're going to have a bear encounter. You're going to make a lot more noise because you're in a group. It's really important not to spread out. I just remember hiking a lot of times and sometimes people be in a group, they start out in a group and then somebody just bolts out and goes way in front and then some people want to stop and smell the roses or the flowers and they hang out back. So they're no longer a big group. So it's important that you stay together talk between yourself before you go out and say, hey, are we going to stay together? So that if some people want to break off, they can break off as a group and the others can stay, um, stay and go a little slower. <clears throat> you want to leash your pet um, or leave it at home. So the problem with having a dog off leash, if it's not really, really well trained, a dog has a really good nose and they're very curious and they're faster than we are. So they can go out sniff out a bear, find the bear, bark at the bear, and then they're going to run back to you. Um, there are some big game um, hunting dogs that they're very well trained, they're bred, and they're, they're trained not to go back to the person. But those, like I said, you have to have them well trained. They're, they're fairly rare. <clears throat> you want to um, use all your senses to stay, um, to stay aware which means you don't want to put your earbuds in your ears. Take those out, you know, listen to the birds singing, listen to, to the wilderness. Um, if you have the headphones, you can just come up, uh, across a bear or a moose or a wolf and you just won't even know it. Also, you want to use your sense of sight. Um, you want to look for tracks. This is another good way to tell whether the bear is a black or a grizzly bear um, by looking at the claws and how far it comes from the foot of the, the foot pad of the bear. Um, look for scat and also look for um, scratches in trees. And that can alert, alert you to whether the bear is around. It can also tell you how recently it's been there. Okay. And so, uh, what slide is this? So this is, this is where I'll, I'll take over for a little bit if okay. that's okay, Marian. Yeah, so um, as Marian said, <clears throat> There's lots of things that you can do to, um, you know, be prepared when you are out on the trails or out recreating in Alaska. Um, should you encounter a bear first? That's that's great, but how that outcome evolves um, definitely how how your your behavior will help um, influence the outcome of your bear encounter. And of course, we all want a positive bear encounter. Uh, the first is stay calm. That's not always easy, right? a bear it's exciting your heart rate goes up maybe you have a little adrenaline um it's not easy to stay calm but take a couple deep breaths and don't panic of course um the aid the age-old advice still rings never run from a bear um bears are a lot like dogs you know um when you if you were to throw a ball for a dog it's going to chase it instinctively uh bears have that same instinct to chase if they see something so never run um if if the bear does notice, does not notice you, 
um, just move away quietly, go back the direction that you came. And as you're leaving, keep your eyes on that bear. Um, if the bear does notice you, uh, that's okay. Um, the first thing you want to do is stop and ready your deterrent. Okay, that deterrent is already going to be on your hip. It's going to be on a side holster across your front. You're going to ready. You're just going to have it in your hand ready. Um, you're going to face that bear if you're in a group. Like we saw in that earlier photo of those, uh, those group of three, you're going to group together. Maybe you'll put your hands up in the air. That's okay. But you're going to alert the bear to what you are by talking to it calmly. Um, and, um, you know, Marion's right. You can clap. You can do use any number of ways to make noise when you're moving. But when you are, when you are in that bear encounter, it's important to let that bear know that you are a human. And one of the best ways that we can do that, one of the best tools that we can use is our voice, because there's no other sound in nature like the human voice. But again, we don't want to alarm the bear. We just want to tell it what we are. And so speak to it. Hey, bear, I'm just here, and I'm just walking down this trail. But if you want the trail, I'll go back this way. Um, but you do want to let it know what you are. Okay. So <clears throat> there's two types of bears that you could encounter, two main types. And the first is a defensive bear. A defensive bear is one that is going to act in a defensive manner because somehow it feels threatened by your presence. Lots of reasons that a bear could act defensively. Um, it could be that you surprised it. Uh, bears are not too dissimilar from us. If we get surprised, we might jump or scream or act in a way that we wouldn't otherwise. Bears are the same way. Uh, if a bear, bear has, a, they need a lot of personal space. Uh, bears with cubs need a whole lot more personal space, just like we do. If a stranger gets too close to us, we don't like that, you know? So bears are the same way. Um, they might react defensively um, by telling you, you're too close to me. Um, or, you know, bears have to work very hard for their food. Um, and, uh, and so if a bear feels as if you might be a threat to that meal that it worked so hard for, it will act in a defensive manner. And as you can see, we have some bullet points here for behaviors that indicate this bear may be defensive. It will huff and stomp, kind of <laughs> stomp its feet on the ground, it makes this popping sound with its teeth that I'm not going to even try to, but, um, it pops its jaw somehow. Um, you'll see maybe some excessive salivation happening around the jaws. Ears will be laid back. Um, it may charge at you. More often than not, a bear that charges, especially a defensive bear that charges, it's a bluff charge, which means it may come at you, but at the last second it will veer off before making contact. Again, this is that moment when you remain calm and you stay still and you don't run. Um, but your, your deterrent is ready. And I will just say this, um, you know, when it comes to, I do get the question often, when, when do you deploy that deterrent? This bear is coming at you. And I will say that, you know, just like a bear has personal space, we have our personal space as well. And if that bear were to come, you know, too close for your comfort, you know, it's, it's within range of a uh, bear deterrent, like bear spray, which is about 15 to 20 feet, it's okay to deploy that deterrent. Um, so that's some of the behavior of a defensive bear. Um, Let's see, next slide here. So behavior of a non-defensive bear, it's a little different. Now, uh, uh, to give you an idea of, of where this, this bear might be in, acting in a non-defensive manner is that it may just approach you. Um, and there's multiple reasons for that. It could be that it's on its travel corridor, its travel route, and it's just walking along and it's saying, yeah, no, this is my trail and I'm gonna keep going. Uh, it could be that it's curious Oftentimes bears that are curious or testing dominance are often younger bears. They just haven't learned that humans are not something that they really should mess with. Um, they could be food conditioned. Um, and the, you know, in urban environments, we do encounter that. Um, for any of you in Juneau who have been experiencing our, um, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? For our uh, active bear season this year, you may know that these bears that have become food conditioned, and a food conditioned bear is one that has le learned to um, associate humans with food. It has learned to get garbage um, or bird seed or chickens from chicken coops. And um, they're really hard to scare off of that source of food that it now thinks it's its own. 
Um, and then occasionally a non-defensive bear will be approaching you because it's potentially predatory. That is highly rare. Now, what it will do is it will approach you usually silently, um, as opposed to having its ears back, the ears may be up, and you kind of perked forward. Its eyes will be focused on you, um, uh, or it may approach uh, deliberately, or it may pull you. Now, a non I should say a note real quickly about these various behaviors of both defensive and non-defensive. These are behaviors that these types of bears may exhibit. Um, you may see one of them, but not, you know, but not the others. You may see all of them. Um, but these are some clues to help you understand the behavior of that bear and help you act accordingly. So how do you respond to these, these two different types of encounters? Well, initially you respond exactly the same. First thing you do is you stop, okay? Again, don't run. The next thing you do, and this is important, after you stop, you immediately ready for deterrent. And then again, you, you identify yourself to the bear. Hey bear, it's just me. Um, I'm, I don't mean to get in your way. We're gonna, we're gonna leave calmly. You go ahead and have this trail or you go ahead and have that berry patch, it's all yours. Um, and again, if you're in a group, you, um, you just want to, uh, to group up to again, um, not only make yourself look bigger, but also if that bear does wanna get out of your way, it has many more exit paths to go down. If you're spread out, the bear might feel like it's a little bit more trapped than if you're all in one spot. Um, the other thing, the next thing you wanna do um, is watch that bear, observe its behavior. See if you have, can identify some of the different behaviors that we just went through. Again, though, do not run. Now, if that bear approaches, um, that defensive bear approaches to um, a, a distance that is out of your comfort zone and it's within the range of the bear spray, 15 to 20 feet or so, deploy your deterrent. Um, if, you are, if it's a non-defensive bear, if that bear continues to approach, this is where it changes slightly and you want to up your game. So this non-defensive bear doesn't see you as a threat. So what you want to do is you want to become a little bit more threatening. So instead of just, hey bear, it's me, you want to be like, okay, no, we're done. No bear. You know, hey, get out of here, bear. Um, you call it up in the game. Um, and then if that bear continues to approach you, it's within that comfort zone that you're not okay with, deploy your deterrent. Okay, so let's say that things progress. Um, ideally, you've deployed your deterrent in both situations and the bear, you know, gets the message and, and disperses. In a defensive bear attack, um, this is an attack is if it makes contact with you. If a defensive bear makes contact with you and knocks you to the ground, in this situation, this defensive bear is acting this way because it sees you as a threat. You want to make yourself as, um, as least threatening as possible. You want to um, take the stress level down. So you want to, but you also want to protect yourself. So if it knocks you to the ground, you lay face down, okay, with your hands clasped behind your neck like this and your legs spread. You're protecting your vital organs and you're making it so that the bear has a hard time rolling you over. Uh, like I said, spread your legs and elbows. Um, you want to, again, make yourself non-threatening. So do not struggle or cry out. Uh, the bear might misinterpret that as you acting threatening for some reason. Um, you want to not move, you want to remain still, and this is where you would, you know, kind of play dead. Do not struggle or cry out, remain still, and um, wait for the bear to leave. Now, for those I've spoken to, and many accounts, this part is where it feels like it lasts forever. Um, but you want to wait there in that pose as long as possible, longer than you think you need to until longer and you think you need to until you are sure that the bear has left the area. If you get up too soon or make noise too soon and that bear hasn't completely gone away, that bear may think, oh, this is still a threat and come back and knock you back down again. Um, now, if it's, uh, if it's a pred, oh, this is what it looks like here. This is an example of what that pose looks like on the ground. Um, if a bear makes contact with you that does not appear defensive, aggressively fight off the bear with any means available. As in the bear knocks you down and the bear does not leave, the bear continues to you know, bite at you, then you will, will aggressively fight back, you up your game to the next level and you know, anything you wanna aim with rocks or sticks or you know, the butt end of anything that you have, go for the eyes and the nose um, and anywhere on the face really. 
So I went through that kind of fast, but let's review. So what do you do when encountering a defensive bear? Well, first you stop, okay? You assess the situation. The next thing you do is ready your deterrent. And some of these things can be happening simultaneously. So you can be stopping, pulling out your deterrent, and also at the same time saying, hey, bear, hey, and gesturing to some of your hiking you know, members like, hey, come here, you know. Keep your bear, assess its behavior. And again, if it gets within your comfort zone, 15 to 20 feet or so, deploy that deterrent. 20 feet. Well, well that's ridiculous. I mean, so, uh, did you guys have a, sorry, did you guys have a question? Okay. Um, go ahead and ask a question in the chat if you want, or if you have one now, we'll wait till the very end and we can take all the questions that folks want to ask. Um, what to do when encountering a non-defensive bear? Again, it's very much the same. You stop and assess the situation, ready your deterrent, use a calm voice and group up, watch that bear, and do not run. Now, if that bear continues to approach you, that's when you, well, like I could say, up your game. Oh, bear, hey, no, no, this is, no, I don't, you don't wanna mess with me. And then again, once it gets into that comfort zone or within that 15 to 20 feet, deploy your deterrent. Um, so, very similar reactions, except as you get down this, this, uh, this list, that's when it starts to change. Um, so we're gonna shift into being aware and being prepared um, in different situations, hiking, camping, and I'll hand it back off to Marion. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so yeah, we're, we're gonna take a little turn here and um, just talk about what to do when you're recreating and having fun in bear country. So let's say you're hiking and some of this is going to be a little redundant, um, but some of it's very similar. When you're hiking in bear country, you wanna make a plan. Um, I call it a flight plan when I go out. You wanna let somebody that you trust and know well, want, you want them to know where you're going, what time you plan to, to return. And the most important part well, one of the most important parts is to let them know when you do return. Um, you don't want your family or friends to be going out, getting a search party together to go and find you when you're at home having a snack or what have you. Again, be aware. And like we said earlier, look for bear sign, look for scat tracks. You can even sometimes find bear hair in bark or on branches just to see, you, you know, you know that they've been there, um, and maybe even recently. Again, carry bear spray, have it handy, and not inside your pack. Uh, again, travel in groups, and that's always going to be the case in bear country. The more people you travel with, like I said, the less likely you will encounter a, a bear. Keep your pets close, under your control, or leave them at home. Um, and if you do see a bear or any other wildlife, let other hikers know that it's there. Be courteous that way. <clears throat> so when you're camping, you wanna uh, pick, pick a safe campsite. And what does that mean? Well, for one thing, if you, you use your sense of smell and you're smelling something that smells really bad, like a carcass or fish waste, that's not a good place to be camping because bears will likely be there. You wanna also avoid bear trails. Um, you can sometimes tell where bear trails are just looking at the tracks, looking at the ground. You wanna be aware of narrow beaches and allow plenty of room between you and a traveling um, bear. You wanna practice leave no trace and you wanna uh, pack up all attractants and so Attractants for when you're camping, that can mean soap or shampoo, your toothpaste, your toothbrush, your deodorant. All of that are bare attractants. You also wanna use the triangle method when possible. And what that means is um, you want to set up your camp or your tent upwind of your food. And so where you cook and where you store your food. And so, um, Let's see, the legs of the triangle, you know, it just, how long, sh how, how far between should that be? And that just kind of depends on the area. If you can, the further the better. Um, you want to get as far away from that food smell as you can. 
and what what to do if you wind shifts direction i would just i'd change i would just move the tent but you want to kind of figure out what the prevailing wind is most times so you don't necessarily have to do that um, when you camp you want to store your food and the picture on the right these are really handy to have um, these bear resistant containers uh, they have backpacking ones that you fit right into your tent You put your toothpaste, your soap, everything in there, including like dish soap and then all your food. They, it actually holds quite a bit. But don't forget to bring a quarter or something so you can open it when you get to your campsite. Um, you can also hang food when possible. Um, hang them high, but that's doesn't necessarily mean the bear can't climb a tree and get it, but you want to make it as difficult as you can for the bear and put a lot of effort into this. Um, you want to keep your garbage, your dirty dishes and toilet trees, like I said, away from where you're sleeping. They have really good noses and they can sniff that stuff out. Uh, when you're fishing in bear country, again, fish with other people, um, carry your deterrent. You want to clean your catch at the shoreline and dispose of guts and fast moving water. And also if you're filleting along the um, side of the river, you want to cut the bigger pieces up into smaller pieces and then throw it in the fast moving water because it, it'll be easier for that waste to go down into the river and not necessarily get hung up on shore and become a bear attractant. Um, always keep your fish and coolers near yourself. You know, you might get all excited because you saw fish jumping, you know, in a different area and you just want to go there. Bring your coolers um, and your fish with you. If a bear does approach you, um, when you have a fish on, you don't want that bear to associate that fish with you, um, with, a, with a person, because they're smart animals. That's a learned behavior and they'll do it again. So you want to cut your line if a bear is going after your fish. Uh, mountain biking, and I guess in this category too is wilderness running. It's a higher risk because you're going faster. Um, on a bike, you're not gonna hear as much. Um, you're focusing on changing your gears, uh, things like that. But, so the faster you go, the higher the risk, whether it be running or biking. When you are biking, you don't want to carry the spray on your bike because you can become separated from your bike. Um, and again, you want it on your person, but somewhere where you can get to it quickly and easily. You want to, again, avoid trails and near salmon streams. So know when the, the fish are running. If the fish are running on the salmon streams, avoid those trails. Um, slow down at blind curves and of course make noise. Clap your hands, yell out, whatever it takes. Watch out for bear signs. Now that's kind of hard to do on a mountain bike because you're moving faster, but take a break and look around you. Um, just see what's going on. You want to, you can use noisemakers on your bike. Um, I've had success with um, small air horns, but I would never have that in place of bear spray. That just can scare away a bear that's maybe a little bit far away or you know approaching you or what have you. Um, and bells on your bike, that does make noise too, and I guess it can't hurt to do that. Um, again, don't wear your headphones. You wanna be able to hear and ride in groups. Okay. So now let's shift gears to have um, safety around your home. So you have uh, these two bears, and one bear is getting some really easy calories. He's in this garbage or she, um, the, there's no lid. You see probably already knocked down two uh, garbage cans. Um, and then the bear on the right, this is a, probably a bear, I think it's from the zoo, trying to get into a bear resistant garbage can. And it's something they do on Mother's Day um, pretty much every year, of course not this year because of COVID, um, but they just test it out to see how they work. Um, you don't want to, oh sorry, you don't want to leave your bear garbage out. Um, you want to keep it in a secure um, area such as your, um, oh, like your garage or a shed or something like that. And don't take the garbage cans to the curb until the day of trash pickup. You don't want smelly garbage to be sitting out to attract the bears. Okay. There are other attractants too that you want to keep out of reach of bears. There's, um, if you feed your dogs outdoors, you want to you want to collect the extra food and bring it inside. Don't leave bags of dog food outside either. 
as far as bird food goes, um, birds need to find their own living in the summertime. They don't need your help. It's good for them to, to become independent and get their own food. So, um, and it's also lots of calories and protein in bird feed, and it is a very big attractant of bears. So we ask that you bring it in when the bears become active in the spring. If you listen to the news and you hear bear activity, bring it in, but don't only bring in the food. There's gonna be a lot of seeds underneath the bird food um, feeder. You wanna clean that up too. Um, that's really important. In Anchorage, we typically say bring your uh, bird, food, bird feeder in on the 1st of April, but you know, we have sometimes have really warm springs and the bears can be out earlier than that. So I would recommend listening to the news and reports and things like that about bears. We already talked about um, bears in, tra in the trash and unsecured garbage. Um, as far as them filleting your fish or processing your fish, and if you have fish waste, I recommend putting it in a freezer um, in, before until right before trash pickup because otherwise you're going to have smelly fish in there it could be for you know almost up to a week so freeze it and then throw it out the day of trash pickup as far as livestock um, an electric fence around your livestock can um, deter a bear we have um, we have a website that's just been updated on information on how to set up electric fences, where to get these. Um, and if you're interested, just get hold of Abby or myself and we can send you a, a link to this site. And then let's talk a little bit about uh, these bear resistant uh, trash cans. Remember, bear resistant cans are not bear proof. Um, you need to actually um, check your, your canister, make sure the lid is shut properly. Um, the, make sure the mechanism is working. I have one of these and every time I open it, I, um, every time I use them, I shut it really hard and then I try to open it. And it's surprising, sometimes they'll open. Um, in Juno especially, you have freeze-thaw cycles and that can block the mechanism and causing them not to, to work really well. They, are, they can be effective if used correctly. Um, and also, I guess, um, if you don't have a place to store your trash, it's best even with a bear resistant container to keep it in a stored place. But if you don't have that option, you might want to think about upgrading to a bear resistant can. The cost of this varies depending on where you live. Um, it's about three, in Anchorage, about three dollars um, extra a month. So just check in with your waste company and see um, how much that might cost you. Uh, this is a fun video. This video was done by the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. It was a camera collar study. Uh, wildlife biologist Sean Farley did this study. So this is a black bear with two cubs getting into trash. Trash is in, unsecured, just having a feast. And now she found bird seed and a grease trap on a barbecue. So yeah, it's a good idea to clean them. This is an apiary, and so this one actually has uh, an electric fence, and so the bear just went right by. It was eating kibbles that was left out in the yard, and now they actually got into a garage, and all three of them are feasting on dog food. Um, they also like the sense of boat hatches, and this is an empty refrigerator that one that the same bear got into. Probably had residual uh, smells in it. If I could add something, Marion. Yeah, please do. P people are sometimes quite surprised at the dexterity of these bears, right. um, and and I don't blame them. I mean, I we are constantly surprised, and um, you know, with bears having this fantastic sense of smell. Um, and also being quite curious, they really will investigate anything with a scent. Just I think it was today or yesterday, a woman posted on Facebook about how she was in her car on a Zoom meeting at the Mendenhall Glacier and a bear opened up the hatch on the back of her car, hind <laughs> legs and peeked right in, kind of, you know, looking around. It, 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 the incident went out, went, uh, it ended without, you know, anything negative happening. The bear went on its way. But what that tells me um, is that that bear had 
at one point smelled food inside one of these vehicles, potentially opened it and gotten a reward. And so once it figured out how to open these doors and, you know, doing it, even if they don't smell anything inside it, like this freezer, for example, it probably had residual scent, uh, but, um, but uh, you know, there's nothing in there now. So uh, just really don't underestimate the curiosity the, the, the sense of smell that a bear might have, and then also, apparently also its dexterity. Thank you, Abby. So this I wanted to talk a little bit about. So we've been, these past couple slides, we've talked about, uh, you know, bears getting into attractants and, and uh, you know, bears that will do that repeatedly become what we call um, food conditioned. Uh, and, um, you know, bears that are food conditioned also tend to become also habituated and habituated is when a bear um, is not will not change its normal behavior in the presence of humans uh, they have not learned to fear humans in any way in fact oftentimes they have a neutral relationship with humans an example of a habituated bear would be one at say um mcneil river sanctuary or Pack Creek down here those bears that frequent those areas are used to seeing humans and therefore aren't, you know, they don't have any feelings really about their presence. Uh, now a bear that's been food conditioned and is also habituated, that's when we run into problems and, and typically uh, it doesn't end well for the bear in that situation. Now this story though, this is the story of a food conditioned bear. Uh, this is a bear, a young bear that was a black bear that was collared in the Mendenhall Valley uh, of Juneau. It's a, it's a highly populated area consisting mostly of residential homes. And um, you may recognize this aerial shot from one of the earlier slides in the presentation. Um, these are GPS coordinates from the black bear in, uh, during the day. So as you can see during the day, this black bear hung out in a lot of uh, green belts, wooded areas. But in the evening, this little bear would come in and raid homes and get into trash. The, t the timing of these GPS coordinates uh, was about early spring, so April to about end of May. Now, uh, once July hit and the berries ripened up high in the Alpine, this bear moved up into the hillsides of Thunder Mountain where it, feed, where it fed on berries for the remainder of the summer. So what's the moral of this story? It's that when, for most bears, even though they become, can become food conditioned, if humans can do our part in preventing the bear from getting into our attractants, and you know, ideally mother nature cooperates as well and the berries come in or the salmon come in, those bears will move off and, and, uh, and forage in, in their more wild foods. And, um, and this, is a, this is an example of when a bear did that. So um, living in bear country is wonderful for many reasons, but it does also come with another layer of responsibility. And that's why in a lot of these presentations we do talk about um, securing your attractants, and, and because it's not just about keeping our bears wild, but it's also about keeping our neighborhood safe. Like I said, a bear that's been food conditioned and also habituated can be really dangerous. Um, but anyway, I thought this is kind of a, a nicer story to tell. Um, now we're going to segue into moose safety. And in Juneau, you know, we don't have a lot of urban moose at all, uh, but we do occasionally see moose as you get out north of town. But I'll hand it off to Marion here because in Anchorage, they do see a few more moose than us. Yeah, thank you, Abby. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about moose safety. And even if you live in Southeast and you don't see a lot of moose, you may travel to Anchorage and hike in, in Anchorage or the valley. Um, and so it's still good for you to, to know what to do in moose country. So let's look at this picture. Whoops, can you go back? Sorry. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. So in this picture, you know, you look at it and, and you look at the body language of the cow. She seems okay, but the red flag I have is that she has two calves, and that right there is telling me it's probably not a good situation, but it's not the worst. So we'll contrast that to a couple other pictures. Okay. So with this, this also is a cow with two calves, and um, I don't know how big the lens is or how close the photographer is, but I'm looking at the ears, and her ears are back, so she might be a little annoyed um, if she senses the person's presence. Okay, so the picture on the left is Bull Moose. He's not happy. His ears are, you know, his ears are laid back. His ruff is up. And if you look closely on his left leg, 
he's got a pretty good gash in there. And my guess is that um, these wrought iron fences with the sharp uh, peaks on top, they do kill a lot of um, moose, at least in the Anchorage area. I don't know what a lot, but at least a few that I know of. So my guess is this moose jumped the fence and probably gouged his leg. I would not want to be around this moose. I'd be getting out of there. Um, the picture on the right to me is a very disturbing picture of a moose. It's a mother with a young calf, and she is making herself really, really big. Her ears are back. She's looking right at the photographer. Um, she might be making like a, a noise they can make. They can get very agitated before they charge. But look at her ruff. Not only is her ruff up on her neck, but it's also up on her rump. I would be getting out of there very, very quickly because it looks like she's about to charge. Um, what do you do when a moose charges? Well, um, you never, never, never want to run from a bear. But a moose, yeah, you want to get out of there because they're not predators and they're not seeing you as food. It's not going to be a predator prey sort of thing. They just want you out of their space. Um, so if they do chase you, you want to get behind something if you can, like a tree or um, if you're in the city, maybe a telephone pole. Um, or whatever it takes. So just get a lot of distance before she has a chance to, to go after you. Okay. And um, we have approximately 160 moose killed in the Anchorage area every single year. That's a lot of moose um, collisions. And so ADFNG came up with it's a moose collision, um, moose collision thing where we're, um, we want to give people um, some tools how to avoid maybe getting into an accident with a moose, but also how to let other drivers know um, that a moose is in the road or what have you. Can you go ahead forward, Abby, please? And so this is the moose um, collision. And so what it is is um, give your hazards a flash to avoid a crash. So a lot of people think that oh, I have to stop to turn on my hazards. That's not necessarily a, the case. Of course, if the, if the moose is walking right in front of the car, you, you want to put on the brakes, but what you're trying to do is warn people. And hazards are better than um, turning on your brights because you're warning people in front of you as well as in back of you. And that's Miles Moose. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Marion. So um, I'm going to take a little bit, uh, take on the wolf safety segment here. And, um, you know, uh, d when encountering a moose, it's the opposite of a bear. You do want to run. Again, um, you know, that, that moose really just wants you out of its space. When you encounter a wolf, uh, it is a little different than when encountering a bear in that um, with a bear, you do need to read uh, the situation a little bit. With a wolf, you always want to immediately up your game. Uh, if you encounter a wolf and it is coming at you and looking at you like this wolf is in the photo, you immediately want to up your game. You immediately want to be threatening to that wolf, aggressive to that wolf, and you want to begin to fight that wolf. Just let that wolf know you are not something that it wants to mess with. You are not a prey uh, target of that wolf, and, and it'll be sorry if it does mess with you. So. You know, if you are hiking on a trail, pick up sticks, pick up rocks, throw it at the wolf. Um, if you are out skiing in the winter, um, use your poles, use your skis, use anything you can to um, let that wolf know that you are, you are not something it wants to mess with. And if you do have deterrent on you, go ahead and deploy deterrent. I've had people ask me, you know, what does, what, what does bear spray work on? Does it work on things besides just bears? Oh, it definitely does. Um, it works on wolves, moose, humans, all, all kinds of things. I think the only thing, and this is a true story, uh, is there was a, um, there was an aggressive domestic goat in Juneau that was harassing some individuals. I think it was Juneau, uh, and harassing some individuals and someone deployed bear spray on the goat and it didn't phase the goat at all. But I think that's the exception. Uh, that I, that's the only exception I've ever heard of, bear spray, um, uh, is exceptionally potent and uh, anything with mucous membranes, eyes, nose, uh, that uh, the cat sees them in the bear, in the bear spray will get into those, those zones and um, cause a lot of discomfort and pain for 
for some time. Uh, so uh, with wolves, um, that's really all there is. Like I said, encountering an aggressive wolf is very rare. Uh, it does occasionally happen. Um, one thing about wolves that I will note that has happened in Juneau in the past couple of years, and I think as well, Marion uh, mentioned as we were preparing for this presentation, it's happened up in South Central as well, is uh, that bears have, not bears, excuse me, lots of bears tonight, wolves rather, have been known to, um, to, to lure uh, uh, dogs away from their owners and take the dog. And that does happen. Uh, again, that's very rare. Um, so the best course of action, if you are, if you've heard, if you've heard wolves howling, um, if you've seen wolf, uh, you know, tracks in the area or other wolf sign, um, you definitely want to keep your dog leashed. That's the best course of action there. Um, and, um, and make sure that there's no opportunity for any wolves to do that. Again, if you do see a wolf, chances are it'll only be for a second. Um, and if you are out walking your dog and you've heard wolves in the area, or heard of them, um, definitely want to keep that dog leashed um, and uh, under you know your control. So uh, let's say that you do um, need to give us a call uh, or need to call someone in case uh, here's some various numbers for you to jot down. I encourage you to uh, either take a picture of this um, uh, slide or uh, screenshot it um, and uh, because there are some important numbers on here. You only call 911 if a human life is being threatened. Uh, it can be by a bear, it could be by a moose, it could be by a wolf. Um, if a bear is getting into your garbage actively, um, if you're in Juneau, you wanna call the police department. Um, Alaska State Troopers are also available for that as well, although police department is your first course of action. Um, if you just want to report a wildlife sighting, 24-7, um, our Fish and Game uh, website has online reporting available. In Juneau, our local area biologist is Roy Churchwell. And so if you have a bear that is um, consistently damaging property, property consistently uh, being threatening to individuals in a neighborhood, uh, that's then you would call Fish and Game. And we may look at um, ways to uh, alleviate that problem. And um, Juneau main office line is there. And then our biologists are available from 8 to 4.30. Um, I have a question here. So is bear spray basically pepper spray? What is it made of? Yes, Heather, bear spray is basically pepper spray. Uh, it's made of capsicum, which is um, a, uh, a concentration of uh, peppers. Uh, um, you know, not your habanero pepper, but similar. That's, that's the basic compound that makes it hot. Um, what should we, Don asked, what should we do slash our behavior be after we deploy the deterrent? That is a great question. Um, I would deploy deterrent. And again, when that bear comes within 15 to 20 feet, you want to um, deploy that deterrent. And the way that you do it is, let's say that I, there's that photo of the woman, or there's an earlier slide of a woman with bear spray on her hip. Bear spray is in a canister. I'm gonna use my phone for this. But basically, if the trigger is up here, you wanna have your um, thumb on the trigger, you have your hand wrapped around, and you are going to deploy that trigger for one, 1,000, two, 1,000. And the idea is that you wanna deploy it forward and down uh, because you're creating a wall between you and that animal. The animal has to come through a wall to get at you. Uh, some people will use a zigzag pattern. Some people go up and down. Or some people just go straight out and kind of angle it down. Um, after that has happened, you wanna watch and observe the behavior of that bear um, or the wolf or the moose. Chances are that animal is gonna hightail it out of there. Again, stand your ground. Use your senses to assess the situation. If that animal should come back, deploy it again. Uh, bear sprays are not single use. Typically they three to four uses. Um, you can feel the canister after you've used it. It will get lighter. You can kind of hear the, the, um, the fluid inside, um, kind of like a, uh, like a, a spray, nonstick spray can or an aerosol can. You can kind of hear when it's getting low. Um, that's kind of the behavior you would do. Uh, Patty asks, are there places in Juneau where wolves are more active? So we do have wolves on the mainland of Juneau, which is right behind kind of downtown. There is a pack of wolves on Douglas, and I'm gesturing because I'm sitting in the Douglas fishing right now. We do have a pack of wolves on Douglas. Um, we don't know the size of the packs, uh, but we do know that the pack is large enough that they do have a breeding male and a breeding female. Um, we have tried to get a population estimate of the pack on Douglas. 
Um, and to give you an idea of how um, elusive these animals are, um, our two trained uh, wolf biologists have been trying to, in order to get a population estimate, you have to typically get a collar on a wolf. We've been trying for three years now to get a collar on just one wolf on Douglas, and we haven't been able to, so they're really elusive. Um, what should we do? Uh, so I hope that answers your question, Patty. And um, are there places where do you have more? Um, okay, Allison asks, uh, what should we do if someone in our group is attacked by a bear? That's a great question. So um, if you have deterrent on you um, and that person is actively being attacked by that bear, I would deploy the deterrent. Um, it's, it may hit your friend, but it will also hit that bear. Um, and hopefully that bear is shocked by that spray of deterrent and, and flees. Um, you can then grab your friend and immediately get them back to, to get medical attention. Um, that's, that's what I would recommend doing. Um, Marion, do you want to add anything else to that? Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. That's what I would do too. But every situation is different. Um, you have to, like we keep saying, assess and, and um, think about what you can do. But the, the bear spray is not going more than likely hurt your friend except for more su superficial ways um, but that bear will definitely do a lot of damage if it's actively attacking that um, the person i did want to step back about the bear spray i meant to say this a little earlier too is that um, bear spray does come in different sizes um, i buy the biggest size i can get but you can look there's directions on there that you can read but I really think you need to look to, there is an expiration date on the can um, and they do expire, um, just so you know that. Yes, thank you. And uh, somebody asked a question and I accidentally answered them privately. So I, it's a good question. I, um, I answered it publicly for you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. they were asking if it's being recorded and we are recording this. Um, no names or no or any video are being shown except for the hosts and uh, what we will do is we'll make um, this uh, recording available on our website and then um, we will we'll share that link um, once once it is once it's up there um, there is there is also a link already on the website too if you're interested um, we have a contact um, slide right here oh this is the next one jot yeah. down our contacts and send us an email and we can send you the link yeah, There's also absolutely. a bear spray um, link, how to use bear spray that we can send to. Just ask us if you want us to do that. So these what are, happens, oh, go what ahead. What happens when bear spray expires? Good question, Heather. So um, once the bear spray, once it expires, it doesn't just immediately become inactive. It will slowly over time, however, lose its potency and um, the distance, at, the propellant will lose its effectiveness. Yeah. CSUM will become less potent and the, um, the distance will, will lessen over time slowly. Uh, so if you have bear spray and you know, you're out on a trail and you see, oh shoot, this expired last year, bring it. Just go ahead and bring it. But when you get back to town, do replace it. Um, if it you know, expired 10 years ago, definitely want to replace that as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. So these are um, Anchorage contacts also. Um, similarly, our, um, our, a our uh, contacts for Fish and Game Anchorage, our area biologist is Dave Battle and Corey Stantorf, and there's a new fellow too named Tim Spivey that I'm going to have to add to this list. Um, jot down their numbers if you need to call them. Again, 911 only if human life is threatened by a bear. And the online reporting is the, it's the same as um, the other slide. Okay, yeah, and after hours, if you have a bear problem, uh, you can call Alaska State Trooper Dispatch. Nice. We just had a question here. So oh. what happens if you're upwind of the bear then the bear of the bear spray, you spray the deterrent and it comes back at you, it will. Yes, it will. If you have um, the wherewithal and the forethought to, to close your eyes and hold your breath first, do that. Um, but uh, chances are that, you know, even with a headwind, that bear spray has enough propellant in it that it will go forward, it will create that wall, um, and the bear will still have to go through that to get to you. Um, Still better to deploy it than not. Um, and chances are, you know, don't don't stop to check the wind. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, 
So if you want to contact us, please do. We do take all kinds of questions um, all the time. It's, uh, it's what we like doing is sharing information about this and many other things. Um, uh, this is our email and phone numbers. Um, yeah, let us know. We have a lot of resources to share when it comes to wildlife in Alaska and wildlife safety. Oh, thank you. So everyone, without further ado, if there's any questions, feel free to ask. Um, yeah. All right. We're getting a lot of thank yous in the chat. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Sorry we went a little bit over, but um, appreciate you taking some time out of your night to, sh to join us. So thanks again. Yeah, thank you. Have a good evening. Good night.